The deep grammar and the humor is in a Yiddish uh, basic grammar that runs through a lot of his, uh, his style of recounting. Um, uh, and fortunately, I, I grew up with Yiddish humor, so I get all the jokes. But my students completely, they don't know when to laugh and when to frown. So I find I have to read it out loud to them. And then they realize when they're supposed to laugh. And then it's a little easier. But that's a pretty high bar, okay? I think it's a great book. I like, I mean, I, I like studies in ethnomethodology, but this one is, has, has much more depth to it. And uh, although both books bear repeated readings, uh, similar to the way one reads a really fine poem, uh, you find something in your reading. Um, this one is almost inexhaustible, uh, especially the last chapter, which we're going to tackle at the end. Um, it's, uh, it's, it, and, and it, it, it pays some rewards, but it's not, it's not a text that, you know, oh, I'm going to use this in class. Uh, it's, it's, it's a little rough for that. Um, so you do two chapters in uh, Latin America and the whole book with us? Should we be honored? <laughs> or should we feel? Well, you, you guys are experts in ethnomethodology, right? I mean, if you're going to host a conference especially, right? <laughs> so you have a responsibility, <laughs> sir. I shouldn't have asked. Okay. Um, another thing, uh, the, the author's introduction, um, uh, the, the editor's... The editor's introduction is, I'd say, all right. I mean, it's, it's worth reading, but read it last, because uh, um, it, it's going to delay the time that it takes to get to Garfinkel's difficult prose. So uh, I would dive right into the author's introduction. Um, and it's a... It's even more difficult than the rest of the book because it's like an overture. You, you know when you go to an opera, the, you, you hear a little bit of, of, every, of every song. Of course, this is changing now. I just saw Into the Wood, Sondheim's new, uh, well, an, an, uh, 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 an older piece, but, uh, but it's a new movie. Uh, and, uh, and in this case, Every song is, has combinations of the musical themes of every other song in the movie. They kind of interweave. It's very postmodern, I think. But in the classical opera, you have an overture which is supposed to condition uh, the listener to what songs they're going to be hearing so that by the time the song actually arrives, it's not entirely foreign to them. Uh, and that's sort of the sense in which this introduction should be taken. Um, it's, uh, it, it reviews every theme, and you're not really supposed to fully appreciate each melody until the melody actually pops up in a, in a chapter heading or subheading. Um, so don't expect to understand it, okay, when you first read it, expect particularly this chapter. Um, and then later, don't expect to understand all of it, okay? Uh, but this, this you should have some vigilance about. What you do understand should stun you into wonder. I mean, you should just, when you get an insight, when you get something, it should be, it should move you. And if that's not happening, then you need to have some self-criticism. But... Uh, but don't, don't ask too much of yourself. It's, it's a very difficult text. And so I think it's useful for, for me to, to contribute my experience with the text uh, to you folks. Because the text is, is uh, really pulled out mostly of, uh, from various lectures and seminars that Garfinkel gave over decades that were tape recorded, transcribed, edited into, into this volume. Um, and um, fortunately, uh, 
I was there for most of those uh, seminars and lectures. So, so all these topics I first heard directly, um, so I know uh, uh, how, how to how to orient toward them. Um, if you first turn to the first page, 65, Garfinkel, in the second paragraph, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll read it out loud. Uh, the title of the book is Ethnomethodology's Program, Working Out Durkheim's Aphorism. I want to comment on Durkheim's aphorism. The aphorism is well known to all of us. Our first day of graduate work, we were told to take Durkheim's aphorism to heart, put it on our door cells. See, seeing it there each time, bless Durkheim and bless yourself and learn the mantra. According to Durkheim's aphorism, the objective reality of social facts is sociology's fundamental principle. So, the, the, the orientation of the book is trying to explicate that aphorism with the prejudice, I suppose, that most of sociology has misunderstood that aphorism has not really identified what Durkheim in his own time and place was doing. Durkheim, when he developed this insight regarding the objective reality of social facts, was really involved with people actually creating these objective facts to organize their ordinary society. However, conventional sociology has turned Durkheim at every level, from elementary forms to, to the statistical analyses of suicide, into a, uh, a positivist version of what Durkheim intended. And, uh, and I think Garfinkel is, well, I'd say two things. Garfinkel is right that Durkheim had a much more original insight. I mean, Durkheim was not Georg Simmel, but he was closer to Simmel than he was to, uh, to Robert Merton. Uh, so, uh, so I think he's right about that. On the other hand, everything, every respecification, as we call it, that he makes of Durkheim wasn't necessarily in Durkheim's head, nor should it be, because hopefully we've learned something, uh, especially with the apparatus that we have to work with, with all the, the, the video and, and uh, digital and al analytic tools we have. I mean, we ought to be able to have seen things more, at least more frequently, if not deeper. Um, so uh, I think it's all right for us to, to re-specify in ways that Durkheim maybe didn't imagine. But I think more or less uh, he's right that Durkheim was incredibly concrete. And, one of my professors when I was young was Randy Collins, who is a, uh, a wonderful scholar. Um, and I remember him, I asked him once, what, which book do you think is the best book ever written in sociology? And he said, oh, that's easy. Durkheim's Elementary Forms of Religious Life. It is, it is one of the driest slogs. <laughs> but it's fascinating. I mean, he really understood a, a Aboriginal people without ever being there. I mean, he got some things wrong. I mean, he was really projecting his own Jewish spiritual understandings on a completely non-Western spiritual people. But, um, but he understood a lot. And I find, found his book more helpful in orienting to Aboriginal people than than 99% of the contemporary anthropology that I read. Uh, so, so he did all right. Um, so I, I think Durkheim does deserve his status, but the status is reinterpreted. I mean, everything gets reinterpreted. History is, is something written by people who are alive, right? Um, and so Durkheim's reinterpreted. And I think Garfinkel's being reinterpreted now by by our own sub-school. Um, uh, I just had a series of, of emails, uh, uh, and 
I was complaining that that they're turning Garfinkel into a almost a Heideggerian kind of division between the early and the later. And uh, I can tell you, I was with them, not at the very beginning, but fairly soon after. Uh, and I'm, I, I saw everything as basically this, the same. Uh, I mean, he just got a little deeper. Uh, but there was no major turn in the way there was for Heidegger or some other people. Um, so, so we're reinventing history all the time. In any case, uh, Garfinkel's a little bit reinventing the history of Durkheim, but I think basically he has it right. You'll notice uh, in the next paragraph, uh, he, he talks after the colon on the right-hand column, just below the middle of the page on 65, uh, he says, and descriptions of order in ordinary society that re-specify the concreteness of social facts. And I think, I think this specifying the concreteness of affairs is really what our work is. And it's what distinguishes us from philosophers. Philosophers wax theoretical. Uh, but we have a problem that might be theoretical, but we then go to the world to find real world activities to teach us what the problem really is. That is, we treat our theoretical version of a problem as a, as a tentative gloss for what the problem is, and we try not to become entrapped within how we've, <clears throat> we've phrased that problem theoretically, and instead remain open to how actual affairs uh, can teach us what the problem is, and we might even have to abandon our theory, or we could use the same words and just have a different understanding of it. In any case, grounding ourselves in the concreteness of ordinary affairs is what we're doing. And what we find uh, is, in the next paragraph, the third line, we find that whatever phenomena we're studying, whether they be phenomena of order, phenomena of conversation, uh, phenomena of uh, embodied interaction, um, they, just a simple ask, act of acti asking for directions uh, immediately gets tangled in circumstantiality. And, uh, and you, you'll find that three lines from the bottom on 65. Th that's the exciting part. The theorists don't know about that entanglement because they don't get that close to real affairs. In fact, they don't want to because it's a lot harder. It's a lot easier to keep control of the narrative of your writing if you don't have to trouble yourself with being entangled in these circumstantial affairs. And you might remember uh, that slide I showed last year, which uh, I'll sh show again this summer, of, from the objectivity book uh, of, of the, the, the 1870s, 1880s physicist who was dropping liquids and, and drawing uh, diagrams of how a drop splats uh, and how neatly symmetrical his drawings were and how enthusiastic he was about photography that came along in the 1880s in a big way uh, because he could get it even more accurately and lo and behold when he developed all his prints it was a mess on his hands. I mean there was no symmetry at all. It was like, like nothing like the order that he was uh, able to uh, present in his, uh, in his drawings. Uh, and that's, that's like social scientists that go out and, and uh, they, if they pay too much attention to the actual world in its local details, they're going to be tangled in enough circumstantiality to have to go back to the drawing board. And as Garfinkel used to quip uh, time and time again, that means for sure they won't get their article finished by the end of the long weekend, the long holiday, or you have a, a, an Easter week, nine days to finish those articles, right? Mm -hmm. but, but once you start dealing with circumstantiality, you know, you're, you're going to need at least a summertime, right? And we can't afford that because uh, we have to already start reviewing the lecture for, for, the, for the Tuesday, the first day of classes. Uh, so, so uh, 
And, and my graduate students always said to me, I'm a little afraid of putting you on my committee because I want to get out of here and you're going to make me do serious work that will take a couple of years and I can't afford that. I already owe all this money and uh, I just want something short and sweet and then I add insignificant. Uh, but, uh, but there were a few brave ones along the way. Uh, I, I really think that, that it's short-sighted because you don't have that kind of freedom later. As a graduate student, you have the most freedom. And also, uh, there's very little money in this. I mean, nobody's going to get rich being a social scientist. Um, but, so you have to be paid in satisfaction. And all the satisfaction is being entangled in the circumstantiality. I, I remember a seminar that Jack Whalen and I gave once on field research methods. And, uh, and we were doing some project, I, I forget the details now, but, uh, but <laughs> we, we, the, the issue was that things didn't turn out the way we expected. And the students were very disturbed about this. And Jack and I agreed completely, no, this is the most fun of all. Uh, you know, sometimes things work out so that we're wrong and we discover something. I mean, we're not in charge of the world. Our, our, our job is to discover these things. Uh, and I think both Jack and I were very pleased that we had the same attitude. Of course, our department is a very major department for Marxist sociology, so uh, they, they want to, they subscribe to a dialectics that already knows what the conclusion is. Uh, so uh, uh, they were more disturbed than we were. And then I think they were a little suspicious of us for not being upset. <laughs> but that's, that was, the, those stories you'll have to get from Jack or I much later uh, in the evening. Uh, okay, so on, uh, on page uh, 66, Garfinkel is talking about, uh, well, that's interesting. Uh, it's, it looks complete for me, but... Uh, I wonder what the problem is. It, uh, um, Maybe you should push several buttons. Because what's what's that? May, try to push the next button. Maybe it's... Yes. No. Uh, that one's okay. But, but this one, it, it looks fine in the, in the previous one. The orders and orderlinesses of ordinary society. But you only get the, the last few words... That's never happened before. But they keep changing the program, so... Uh, anyway, this is supposed to, it's supposed to say the... If you look down on the third paragraph on page 66, those respecified orders and orderlinesses of ordinary society. That's what our, the object of investigation is. That's what ethnomethodology is studying. The orders and orderlinesses, of, which is more important words than ordinary society. but. It's strange because it shows up in the in the on the screen on my screen, but then when it goes up, it doesn't. Um, and Garfinkel takes on here by way of his introduction uh, what he calls generic representational theories. That is, uh, um, that that somehow there's an an inclination, a habit, uh, we uh, for among social scientists to turn any insight to to not be satisfied with the concreteness of any insight, but rather to generalize it as a universal principle and to reword it in a universal theoretical language so that it becomes more important that. The concrete description of affairs, of ordinary affairs, in itself is not important enough. And then this probably stems from criticisms that ethnomethodologists get from uh, major professional journal editors that, well, how is what, you, what you've done here any different from a journalist? We're looking for sociology here, not journalism. So if you describe local affairs in their concreteness, uh, that may not be uh, 
you have to be highfalutin and theoretical, you know, which means you have to talk bigger than you are. And so we learn how to talk bigger than we are, and that's why uh, probably most of the articles published in the major journals are unreadable. The prose is just horrible. And you wonder if the people themselves know what they're saying. I mean, <laughs> in, in any case, uh, Garfinkel refers to that way of talking and that way of thinking, which, which the point of, of the chapter, the introduction, is that this is, distracts us from this, uh, this actual work we have of, of finding that circumstantiality. So he's saying that we, if we have these generic theories, we need to re-specify them and to re-specify them as what? As the naturally accountable work of producing and describing the local order. Okay, that's uh, about two-thirds down on the page of 66. So it's accountable work that we're interested in, so we have to discuss accountability. It's natural. Uh, that is, it occurs naturally. We're not doing... Uh, experimental designs. Um, we're not controlling what people do by computerized programs that they, or questionnaires that they answer. Um, but it's naturally occurring phenomenon. I was uh, once, uh, during a Fulbright at the Università di Trento, the first time I went there, I shared an office with a, uh, a Dutch uh, quantitative methodologist who was really at the forefront of the latest uh, uh, software. And he, he asked me one day, he was, he was curious, he said, what, what kind of, of questionnaires do you use? Mm -hmm. And I said, I never ask questions. Uh, and he said, you don't? And I said, no. If you ask a question, you're going to get an answer that, that that depends upon what the person thinks you want to hear. So you're only going to get your own question fed back to you. You're going to get, only going to get the horizon of meaning that you frame the question in, in the person's response. So it's completely biased. And usually they don't even know what I want, so they, they're guessing wrong what, what I want. They're, so they're giving me what they think I want that's not what I want, and that just makes it all useless. And he, he liked that. I mean, he, he was uh, uh, appreciative of, 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 of skepticism in, uh, in an objectivity. Uh, but in any case, we look for naturally occurring phenomena, which is, uh, takes a little longer to do, uh, because you get a lot of data uh, before sometimes you know what you're doing. And it's much easier to go out and do research when you know exactly what you're doing from the very beginning and have such tight control that it's, you're, you're not going to lose control. Uh, and in fact, if you're applying for a grant, you're not going to get the grant unless you can already tell them what it is you're going to find and how you're going to find it. Whereas in ethnomethodology, we, we don't know what the methods are, right? The uniquely adequate provision, the unique adequacy principle is that we find the methods when we find the phenomenon, and we don't know that as a point of principle until the people do it. Otherwise, it's just a form of imperialism. Um, but social science has always been associated with imperialism. I mean, that's how it grew, right? Uh, and it has a hard time shaking it. Um, and I think the reason ethnomethodology success has been limited institutionally is because many uh, sociologists are frightened to death that we're going to expose the BS that they're engaged in. And so, you know, I have a, a, a principle of hiring. Uh, the first thing people look for when they hire a new person is, is there any way this person can get me into trouble? Right? And, and, and that's the criteria, and that's why every department, and my, my associate dean agrees with me, uh, every department gradually becomes uh, 
less confident over time because everybody's trying to hire people less intelligent than they are in order to be safe. <laughs> I mean, it's a terrible situation. Um, but uh, I remember when I was at Indiana University on a postdoc, uh, Shel Stryker, who's one of the best people I've ever met in sociology, or in fact anywhere, uh, he's, a, he's a quantitative symbolic interactionist, uh, as a social psychologist, and he was, had a big NIMH grant, and, and, and he, wanted, he, wanted, he, was, he wanted an ethnomethodologist to, to critique what they were doing, but he, he first invited me to a long interview to see whether or not I was, I was a troublemaker. <laughs> was I going to be offering constructive criticism and not just trying to, to pontificate and satirize? Uh, and, you know... Uh, um, I don't think that the methodologists pontificate, but they do satirize a lot. Uh, and uh, m maybe there's some grounds, but uh, I reassured assured him that I was very ecumenical, but that, that I, I doubted that he would be able to recruit me in the end. Uh, I mean, that I'll participate and, and it, with interest but that uh, I was committed to ethnomethodology, methodology, but in, not in a highly exclusive way, and I ho hope that's the case. Okay, so the naturally accountable work is, uh, means we're, we're trying to learn something, and we're trying to learn something that we don't yet know, which makes it harder to get grants. Uh, and what are we searching? We're searching, we're, we're re looking for the the local order. Now understand that that the describing being done is not our describing and a lot of students will read that describing as the sociologist describing. No, it's the describing of people in the situations that we're studying. They're describing the local events as a way to communicate with each other what the intelligibility of the situation can possibly be. So these are the accounts. Uh, that's the describing. And producing has to do with producing the local order, that the local order is a production of the collaborative uh, energies and interests uh, of people. And there are two interests that always compete for attention. One is the people generally have a task to get that has to get done. If you're cooking a meal for eight, you know, or you're cooking, say, Thanksgiving meal or Christmas meal, and you've got a couple of, of, of chefs working together, you need to produce good food. I mean, that's important. But at the same time, the second agenda is you have to provide structures of communication and talk so that the chefs working together can have clear communication. And there are some, some entanglements, some local circumstances that dictate to people just how they're going to communicate with each other. And they will develop certain regularities, I won't call them rules, for how they how they think together, how they talk together, and how they interact together. And that's all about maintaining the integrity of the communication process and has yet to have a lot to do with how good the food's going to be. So these two, and in fact, sometimes you can spoil the meal by, by preserving the, clean, the clear, clean and clear lines of communication. And I gave at a very early uh, uh, IAMCA meeting uh, the first time we met in Bentley uh, I gave a, a paper on on which became I think the fourth chapter of, of the book more studies in ethnomethodology on my my efforts to communicate with the abbot of the Tibetan monastery he was a guy who spent nine years in prison in the Chet in, in the Chinese controlled Tibet and he was eager, he was so glad to be alive and so glad to have West people from the United States there who were uh, interested in Buddhism. And he was trying to explain philosophy to me from the Tibetan perspective. And 
he considered this a really important historical moment for the survival and transmission of Buddhism in the West. So he was really pleased to teach me, but in that, in that first long year in the monastery, my language skills were somewhat iffy. Uh, and, uh, and we had to interact using words, and I had to pretend that I knew more than I really knew, and I knew how to do that, <laughs> but, but it wasn't until I took the tape home and listened to it twice, uh, th and then came back that I really heard what he said. And he, he, by the end of the year, he called the tape recorder my translator. <laughs> uh, but he himself wouldn't insist that I understood, because it would break down the lines of communication. And he, he would settle for communicating less in order to preserve the integrity of the communication. So we were both, as part of our local work, we were, we were creating a local order in our talk, producing a structure of speaking and listening and responding that would not blow my cover. And he was collaborative in it, uh, and which is, was just fascinating because... I was all about the philosophy, the epistemology. He was all about the epistemology. But if you listen to the tapes, all our work was preserving the integrity of the, uh, of the talk, uh, which was absolutely fabulous. When, when I gave th that paper, I'll never forget, uh, <laughs> Manny Shegloff came up afterwards and said, Ken, that was great. You've got to tell me, what's the beef? Well, well, we're doing the same thing. I said, there's no beef. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, uh, and of course, I, I really love Manny's work uh, because he's so hard-nosed in finding these these local circumstantial details, the the uh, myopic uh, organizing that people do to uh, to make world ha the world happen. So, um, but what I wanted to say here about this producing is um, that's a very Husserlian phenomenological way of, let's, let's say Cartesian way, of describing affairs, as if people know what they're doing, and they're deliberately making decisions and then collaborating in order to produce the order. And uh, that kind of is misleading, because in most situations people don't know what they're doing, and it's the situation itself, it's the spectacle, as Garfinkel would say, that offers opportunities to the participants for, for picking up, repeating, displaying, so that other people can witness, and gradually constructing a, an orderliness. And so at the end of Harold's life, uh, in the very last year of his life, I, uh, he was talking about the produ production of order, I said, Harold, I'm not sure we can really use that word, production. And he stops, and he smiles deeply, and he says, oh, tell me more. <laughs> right? uh, and I said, well, it's, it's a little too voluntarist. Uh, it's as though people are deliberate and knowing in everything that they're doing. He says, yes, that's right, but then what word shall we use? Right? And so we, 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 we need to even speak more carefully. But for the purposes of getting started, I think producing is adequate. And describing is what the people, what the members themselves are doing. Okay. So we're looking at order phenomena. That's, that's a more general way of describing it. Uh, at the bottom of, of 66, um, 12 lines from the bottom... But, comma, whereas formal analytic studies focus on aggregated individuals described demographically as enumerated populations, ethnomethodology proposes instead that the local endogenous workings of the phenomenon, of the phenomenon, the thing, capital T, the social fact, freeway traffic jams, walking together, the exhibited order of service and formatted cues, turn-taking in conversation, all topics at, of one year's seminar or the other that, and Garfinkel's, and only a few of which have been, uh, been written up in detail. Exhibits among 
its other details, the coherence of its identifying orderlinesses. So this, this coherence is very much how people find that coherence is what we're up to. That's the order phenomenon that we're trying to identify. There is a coherence, and, but then you have the problem of how do people share that coherence. And again, I think we have to go a little past phenomenology, although in a certain reading of phenomenology, maybe not past. But it's not that people know first what they're doing, that, that people know first what have a coherent view of things, and then communicate that coherent view of things to other people, although that happens that way a lot of the time. Certainly in my games with rules, somebody would see how the game works and then explain it and then display it. Uh, and then other people would, would pick up on it. Um, uh, that would be a phenomenological, intersubjective way of doing it. But in fact, a lot of times nobody knows a, what the coherence is. And the situation provides a gestalt that offers some coherence in which everybody can see it together so that no individual has it in hand before everybody has it. So it starts out as a, as a social phenomenon. And that's... I, I don't know that phenomenologists talk about that, uh, at least to any great degree. Um, certainly Gervich did. Uh, and it, was, it led to some of Gervich's criticisms of Husserl in the end. But in, in any case, uh, we want to see this coherence. And the coherence isn't always words and meanings and concepts. The coherence is also visual, embodied material, which I think you folks are looking at quite extensively. Uh, if you'll jump to the top of page 67. Um, oh, first I wanted to point out at the, at the, the third paragraph from the bottom of 67. Um, this coherence refers to the activities from the hesitant pause in conversation that precedes the refusal of an invitation to the conduct of wars. Right? Uh, my students want to know how is... How is studying these little details of turn-taking or whatever going to help make the revolution? And, uh, you know, I point out that, uh, that even the people making the revolution have to speak and take turns. And if you don't get a turn to make the critical point, you won't make the critical point. Uh, it's a, sort of the story of the, uh, of the king who lost the war because... Uh, because uh, the, uh, the, the nail fell out of the horseshoe. And because the ho nail fell out, the horseshoe fell out. Because the horseshoe fell out, the horse stumbled. Because the horse stumbled, the king fell to the ground. And because he fell to the ground, he couldn't lead his troops. And so he lost the battle. And because he lost the battle, he lost the war. Because he lost the war, he lost the kingdom, right? I mean, things, if you really look, and we don't have time to illustrate right now, but, but these little details have tremendous consequences. Okay, um, back up at the, at the top of 67. Um, these hexaides of familiar society are the crux of the matter. Ordinary society in concreteness, in lived details, its distinctive details, uniquely identifying of ordinary society's orderlinesses, endogenously produced and accountable, inescapable, and ignored. Okay, they're ignored by the people also. I mean, I'm amazed at how the people I study don't see them any better than the social analysts. I mean, they know them and they work with them. They're just not aware that they're working with them, such as the coffee tasters. They, in fact, to the degree that I've been tolerated by these people, it's been because I've been able to put words to what they know but didn't recognize in a formal way. And they go, oh yes, that's right, that's good. Uh, so the, the, the ignorance there is on the part of members and on the part of analysts. Um, but these, these live details that are identifying, that means we don't have to analyze every detail. We need to, I, we need to analyze those, those details that are most important for the lives that the people are living. 
for the looks of the world that coffee tasters have when they when they go to to taste a cup and that makes that work a little easier but but that's that's an important difference with formal analytic sociology formal analytic sociologists basically analyze a situation only for its relevance to the theoretical interests of the analysts. So you're only looking at kinship, or you're only, I mean, I mean, I mean, Aboriginals care a lot about kin, but they don't care anything about these endless charts that the anthropologists provide. Um, the, uh, uh, you're not interested in, I mean, you may be very interested in one gender issue or another, but if it's not pertinent for the people in that situation, that's not what you, what you look at. You don't constantly reduce everything to what you know best, which is what we all do and what all our students do. Instead, ethnomethodology is saying what's I uniquely identifying, the unique part of that identifying, is it's what the people themselves will recognize as what it is they're up to, as what the looks of the world is for them. Are for them. Uh, so, so I mean, it's much more fascinating when you do it that way. Uh, but it's also much more scientific, and let's not forget, also more ethical, because you're taking people seriously instead of engaging in some neo-imperialism. Uh, I mean, even the Marxists are engaged in neo-imperialism, right? Because they're it's a Western theoretical. Uh, messianism to which they're committed and that's all they're looking for uh, so and without any judgment on the on the the merits of that first you need to find what people are doing oh but that's false consciousness right okay you reduce it back to the to the theory we can talk forever Garfinkel frequently said sociology is a talking science right that we we can talk our way ways through so you can say maybe the difference, if this isn't too, uh, too uh, uh, prejudiced a way of looking at it, maybe the difference between formal analytic ways of working and ethnomethodological ways of working is that the formal analysts do more talking and the ethnomethodologists do more listening. Except we know the ethnomethodologists better than most, and we know they talk every bit as much, right? <laughs> so we have to be, we, we really have to reform our ways and not, uh, and not uh, as a, a, another teacher of mine uh, used to say, P. Peter Berger, above all, don't believe your own propaganda, right? Mm. And, and we're certainly guilty of that. But ideally, let's say, Ethnomethodology is trying to listen more than talk. Um, did anyone look up Hexades? Yeah. Good. <laughs> did you find anything there? Yes. Okay, it's tell from us. From Latin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote down, down that it's thisness. Yeah, I great. I wrote something down in uh, Greek. Toti <laughs> esti. Uh -huh. The thing that is. Okay. Um, yeah. That's that's, that's, interesting. Interesting. that's and, a difference. And I and I looked up how it's pronounced. <laughs> oh, tell us. <laughs> tell us. Well, hexity or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's how. Because that was my main problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, it it refers to the hick and nunk, right? Yeah. Uh, hick being here, uh, the, the the thisness, and I think its first use was by Dun Scotus. Uh, I mean, the popular popularization of it, the, the Scottish philosopher. Um, it refers to ordinary society in concreteness, in lived details, in the way we mean it here. Um, uh, the, the word is certainly not going to uh, pave the way to the success of ethnology. Um, in fact, it may be the very page at which people put the book down. <laughs> but uh, um, it's, uh, it's making things discoverable. Okay. If you look on what was highfalutin? Oh, highfalutin. That's a American slang for for thinking it's a big shot. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Highfalutin means, means take against. Means very fancy. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
if you look on 68, uh, um, the, the first line, um, the objective reality of social facts was Durkheim's descriptive proxy for every topic of logic, meaning, reason, rational action, method, truth, and order in intellectual history, specified in any actual case as a congregationally produced and naturally accountable endogenous order production, populational cohorts concertedly witnessable and recognized intelligible empirical phenomenon of a mortal ordinary society. Well, we could spend the rest of the, of the <laughs> seminar unpacking each word, but um, uh, congregationally produced, that means people are working together, as does the word cohorts concertedly witnessable. They're trying to, whatever ways they find of making organizable or making orderly the local occasion, they are then trying to share with each other and they are concerting their activities so that they can all find their way to the same discovery. Now whether that discovery is something they do together as a concert in the first place or whether they find it individually and then share it is, depends on uh, the circumstances of one situation to another. Um, and I'm, mostly fascinated with how the concert uh, finds its, its music, let's say, uh, first as a whole, rather than as individuals, individuals added together, one at a time. And the Immortal Ordinary Society is this important phenomenon that Durkheim referred to, that Whatever people produce, they think it's the real thing in itself and that they had no hand in it. That is, people typically will believe their own propaganda. And, so just, and that helps, helps enforce the, the, the order. And, and that's a, the, that's what, what Durkheim says provides the moral tone to these resolutions of order. That once it becomes immortal, it's it's like almost a uh, a spiritual uh, commitment, and that if you violate, uh, you violate not only the local order, but you violate the the basic moral principles that the people have committed themselves to. It's like burning the flag. Uh, uh, continuing therein, the phenomena of social order consists of lived. Immediate, immediate, unmediated, congregational practices in their display. That's the important thing. People, as soon as they stumble into something, all together or one at a time, they display it to each other so that others can witness it in their witness recognition, in their intelligibility, and their accountability of immortal, ordinary things in the world. Why, is, why are things, why is things capitalized? Why is the T capitalized? Because they are made into objects that are shared and take on this moral force by virtue of their being shared. And as I hope to show, if not here in later seminars, that that sharedness can take place before people know what it means. And what they've agreed upon and have come to share without knowing what it means, will have a moral force to it before they know what it means. Mm. I mean, that's really incredible uh, and marvelous. <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing to watch that. And, you know, I personally don't think we could identify that level of local detail without uh, audio and videotape. I mean... Uh, we're just lucky we have it. Durkheim didn't have it. Um, now, my friends in the phenomenology movement really wince when they hear that because, oh, it's a tech. You think a technological fix, they read too much Heidegger, right? I mean, <laughs> that, that, the solutions are not technological. Well, it's not 
it's not in the technology of the video, it's, it's our analysis of the video. It's what people are really doing when we can see it. And without the video, I don't care how, how good of a, of a note taker you are. Um, I mean, you know, I, I was able to take, you know, maybe, you know, 20% of what went on in the field uh, in my notes. And, and I had to do it within a day. You know, if I, if I, uh, if I waited until the next morning, uh, it would be down to 5%. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. And then there's the problem of, of understanding what you wrote. So you're down to 2 or 3%, and on the basis of 2 or 3%, the whole history of, uh, of, of sociology and social anthropology was written, right? But with the videos, you know, we've got, you know, Garfield was very tough about this. He says, uh, you don't have the real events with video. You have a, a reduced version of it. You have a, a narrow perspective. Don't be careful. Don't be caught by it. Um, but, you know, it's got to be closer to 40, 50 percent. Uh, anyway, uh, I think it was very skeptical of our ability to delude ourselves. Uh, uh, it, you, you, sh you should all have a look, I think it's chapter 5 of the Husserl's Criticism of Reason book. I think I gave you yes, a copy of that last time. Mm -hmm. if, 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 if I didn't, I've got a, uh, a digital version of that chapter. Yeah. I can yes. mail it to you. It's called Garfinkel's Uncompromising Intellectual Rigor. And it really, it's, it's, it's really worth having a look at. Uh, Harold was very happy uh, about how how accurately I caught his uh, his mode of operation in that chapter. Um, okay, uh, so um, we are interested in this the 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 congregational practices in their display. Uh, you should know what we mean by congregation. I mean, I don't know, you must have a word in Danish that's similar, uh, but a congregation most commonly is when people come together in a church to worship and... Minihil. What? Minihil. Say it again. Minihil. 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 It means... Congregation. <laughs> 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 Try to reconstruct the word. Yeah, great. Well then. I wonder if it has. I wonder There's if it has any relation to minion in in. Uh, yeah. Maybe. I mean that that's the the, the minimum <laughs> number of people you need to have a, a religious observance. Uh, no. But but anyway, the idea is that it's one thing to pray by yourself. But what, what happens is when you do a prayer in public, everybody has to kind of find the right rhythm, the right tone, the right speed, uh, the, right, the right music, the right words, or at least be able to mouth the words so that, that people think you know the right words. Uh, that, that when people congregate their activity, it's a new phenomenon of a Durkheimian sort. Okay. So we're interested in these practices that people do that's oriented to getting on the same page with everybody else who's surrounding us. So, and, and we help each other out by displaying how we do it. You know, uh, the coffee tasters will go, no, no, you just don't, don't uh, sip, sip the coffee. You... You have to have this sound that, that is professional, right? And so you very quickly learn how to do the sound because you know if you don't do the sound, you won't be taken seriously. <laughs> so they're displaying it each time they do it. Um, it's ostensibly for aerating the coffee so that it, it, most of the taste comes from our nose, not from the, the tongue. And so... Uh, to really judge the taste of coffee, you have to aerate it and be able to smell it in the back of your throat, uh, and not just uh, just taste it on your tongue. So, 
if you're professional, you'll, and you can tell people are doing that by the sound they make, right? Only it becomes sometimes obnoxious, <laughs> mm -hmm. so you have to do it discreetly, but still effectively. Uh, so they're, they're, they're displaying how this is done, right? Uh, they're, so that people can see and so that they can witness. Um, and almost every account involves that. That is, it's the ability of the account to organize the local orderliness, which means to get everybody operating in a congregational way. Account involves doing things and holding principles of order with one eye held toward a continuous assessment and reassessment of what it is that can get the organizing done. So everybody is a practical technician of organizing the orderliness. And everybody's participating. You don't just, when you wait for a bus in London, you don't just wait in a line in the proper way, but you have to help administer the line. You have to enforce the line's lineness in, with enthusiasm. If you just wait in line correctly, you'll be a little sus under suspicion. I know, because I'm an American that doesn't take lines as seriously as they do in London. And I don't know why they're upset with me, because I'm waiting in the line. But I'm not, I'm not enforcing, uh, I'm not criticizing violators with the enthusiasm, <laughs> with the proper enthusiasm, right? <laughs> My heart's not in it. And so that's a moral transgression, right? So this orientation to the social is, uh, is part of the accountability. So an account offers a summary of, of what everyone is up to. It's a candidate at first until it gets confirmed and repeated. The summary statement not only reflects what's going on, it helps to actively format and organize what's going on, and that's the reflexivity of accounts. It uses itself to find itself, uh, like the descriptor smooth in coffee. You know, this is, it's not, it's really terrible industrial coffee. But let's say it's smooth, okay? What is smooth? Well, smooth organizes the taster's uh, orientation to the taste, and, but it's still not clear what smooth means. It, smooth will reflexively discover what it means after you taste the coffee. And if you taste a Jamaican Blue Mountain and they say it's smooth, you'll, you'll say, oh yes, now I know what smooth is. Of course, when you run into some other coffee and somebody else says it's smooth and you find that that's a little different than the other smooth, so how can they both be smooth if they're different? then that's the world we're living in, okay? But the, account, the accounts are for organizing so that people know what they're doing, so they can communicate what they're doing, and so they can build on what they're doing. It's a practical orientation that people have. Um, on page 69, at the, the first uh, paragraph, under four, um, uh, EM's program, as the program's incessant concerns with the recurrent figure in that foliage, namely procedures of order production specified as members' methods. So these are procedures that people learn, you know, how, how you do things. And procedures is more than concepts. It's, it's how people move their bodies as well. And it's the, it's a, it's a temporal phenomenon. Members' methods and accountable specifics of instructed actions is, 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 uh, is what we're, we're studying. And what's the instruction? The instruction is people's discoveries about how they can all get on the same page. And so you're constantly monitoring the reception of each candidate account that you develop. And you, you are developing the account not only for the correctness of uh, that list we had before, logic, meaning, reason, rational action, not just for the adequacy, but also for the capacity of that account to 
organize harmoniously the congregational affairs. So again, we have this twofold interest. And he's saying that Durkheim was about both, not just the, the rational. And so he's wanting to, to remind the social scientific establishment uh, that there's this long-standing agenda that if you go back and read Durkheim and go back and read Simmel, you'll discover there is a, a real seriously disciplined curiosity about these phenomena of order. Okay, Summary statements, or elsewhere we call them formulations, uh, are usually tentative until, until their effectiveness is demonstrated, until they, they're confirmed. Um, although they can be uttered with, with just tremendous authority and confidence. And I've just kind of noticed watching too many videotapes that the more confidence that people use to describe something, the less secure they are. I mean, they, they, they try to make up for certainty with tone of voice. Right? Uh, and that, that's really interesting in itself. Again, oriented to the orderliness. Um, so, uh, at this point, Garfinkel uh, notices that this concern to identify what's most unique to the practices of people in a given time and place, in its lived details, is different than just uh, conforming with the, 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 th the slogans found in the established literatures of whatever, if you're a social anthropologist studying Aborigines, you might feel under an obligation to find kinship everywhere. And of course there's a lot of kinship, but it's not the only thing that's there. But that's how you're going to get your career, and that's how you're going to be hired, and that's how you're going to get your article published. So these established literatures are very important. That is, uh, Garfinkel suggests that we be indifferent to the corpus status of established literatures. Eschewing, that means you know, avoiding, not being interested in, the practices of designing administering and interpreting signed objects. What are signed objects? Signs here are, is a kind of uh, semiotic sign. That is, signed is key, terms that have, are buzzwords, sometimes wholesale slogans, in the theoretical apparatus of the received literature, of the corpus status of established literatures. That these terms mean specific things, and when we use those terms, it's not, they are not used strictly for the purpose of adequately describing what it is we're finding, but we're trying to ring a bell so that every one of our colleagues will, will realize that, look, we're in the same church, right? I mean, whether the church be, be uh, structural anthropology or... Uh, our structural functionalist anthropology, or conversation analysis. I mean, whatever it is, we use terms solely for the purpose of ringing the bells of our readers, right? And we're so happy, aren't we? Oh boy, look what I found. I can use this stand. I do it too. It's just a bunch of BS, right? But you know, the wonderful thing about Harold is that when you, you use his terms in that way, to find uh, the local detail in what, what you bring to him with your new research. And he hears you do that. He sees you do that. He comes right out and says, that's a bunch of BS. You know, I mean, you've got to love him for that. As difficult as he was at all times, you've got to love him for that, uh, that hard-nosed insistence on being real. Um, and, uh, and I mentioned that, I think, in some talk or article. And uh, Arlene, his wife, uh, after he died, but before she died, obviously, said to me, uh, I know Harold talked that way, but do you have to, to put that out in the public, that he uses the words BS and bullshit? You know, <laughs> she, 
she was a very genteel southern woman, uh, and uh, she never swore. And Harold was a, a lower middle class New, New Jersey Jew who swore all the time, right? Uh, so, uh, so anyway. This, of course, I mean, <clears throat> is this quote from a time where there was no established literature in ethnomethodology, or is it in a way valid even for, if, if the literature you refer to is ethnological literature, mm -hmm. is it still? Uh, I think he developed the, this phrasing before there was such an established literature. It wouldn't, it wouldn't I mean, ethnological literature would be okay to... to no, <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying. Harold okay. was just as upset about that, and yeah. even more upset. Uh, in, in the same way that uh, the, 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 the great uh, Indian Buddhist philosopher Chandrakirti uh, used to say that, that um, to understand emptiness means that you don't buy into any essentialism, even your own. But to turn the notion emptiness of inherent essences, to turn that notion emptiness into its own inherent phenomenon, uh, means that you you completely blown it. There's no hope for you. There's hope for anybody that hasn't studied emptiness, because as soon as they study it, they'll realize that things lack inherent essences. But if you've studied it and you've turned that analytic into its own reified phenomenon, for you there's no hope. We're just going to you know suspend any 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 possibility that that we're going to. Uh, put you on the right road, right? So in that same way, I think Harold was a little more upset that we would do it to our own ideas than other people would do it to theirs. So that's what Gail Jepson would call reification. Yeah. yeah. It's like not using technical terms in data yes. sessions. Yeah. Because then you already know what you, yes. what you see. Yeah. 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 Don't call it. Yeah. 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 Bravo. So see what it is. Yeah. 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 That's what yeah. she told us. Yeah. That's terrific. I, I hope that's in, in, in the sections that Maurice is, uh, is transferring. No, we need no. to get that out. <laughs> well, that's... Maybe it's too late, huh? Like a <laughs> sessions. Yeah. No. Paper. no, we're always our, our enemy. I don't know if we're our worst enemy, but we're certainly our enemy. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're talking about, on the one hand, literatures, and on the other, local, details, rich, endogenous phenomena, and Harold's way of talking about this is don't write on my words, don't write on the, 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 the term endogenous. You know, it's, it's not to be found in the words. The words won't guarantee or solve anything. But you need to find this, you need to get tangled in the circumstantiality and, and orient yourself to the view of affairs that people themselves have. And then, then you can start describing. And, and the methods we use are not our methods, they're methods that the people themselves are using for organizing their affairs. We're just we're describing what they're doing. Uh, so so uh, it, it can be, as opposed to the re remaining faithful to a, 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 a literature. Uh, I mean, the problem is, it's really tough because you have to read the literature or they'll consider you stupid, right? Not only consider you stupid, but if you don't have the right citations, uh, the editor will get suspicious. In fact, what does an editor do? They first look at your citations before they even decide to send the article out for review. And if you don't engage in these slave-like uh, compliances, uh, you won't get your articles published. But that's all right. I mean, that's just practice. This is being a professional. There's no way we're going to uh, avoid that one. The, what, we, what we can avoid is to avoid uh, buying into our own propaganda, to avoid uh, the spell. And that's hard to do. Uh, I, when I was here last time, I mentioned how before I spent two years with Aboriginal people in Australia, I felt obligated to read a long, high pile of, anth of Australian Aboriginal anthropology. And, uh, and I found it not very useful, because each book was oriented toward 
uh, the research agenda of the literature of the writer. You found Freudian thought, you found Marxist thought, you found structural functionalist thought. I mean, but you couldn't find the Aborigines. Uh, it didn't. But it was very useful for for getting past the formal and informal interviews of the anthropological establishment in Australia, is this guy competent enough to go out into the field? And, and you know, in those days, they had, they policed who got permits to live with Aboriginal people, to visit Aboriginal people, that supposedly for the benefit of the Aborigines, so they're not inundated by either troublemakers or, or, uh, or voyeurs, okay? But, some anthropologists use that as a uh, as as a filtering mechanism to keep anybody who might who might be embarrassing to their work. You know, I mean, it was really diabolical. Uh, but in any case, uh, the problem here is that after reading these twenty books, I couldn't think straight. There's no way I could not see something and pin it on something I'd read. I'm trying to see freshly, which is, you know, the Husserlian epoche, right? I mean, this is what our job is, to see clearly their perspective without categorizing every step of the way. We're blinded not by what we don't know, but by what we do know. And so it's very, very difficult. We have to read these literatures or we won't be taken seriously on the and you learn a few tips you know you you learn you learn for example that uh, that um, what was it in, in Argentina something um, oh I couldn't yawn it's really bad it's a major violation to yawn uh, if you're having a conversation with people and you yawn and because I'm traveling all the time I'm yawning a lot uh, and I I get into my yawning, I like yawning, uh, uh, people would get very offended. As though, oh, am I not interesting enough for you, you fancy professor? You know? <laughs> uh, so, so if you read carefully enough, uh, you know, after 20 books, you learn at some point that the people that you're studying with don't like yawning. So, so you know not to make that mistake. So I won't say that the 20 books were worthless, but, but Really, you have to work hard not to be distracted by those theoretical interests. And that's what Garfinkel's talking about in these, these next few pages, that is not being distracted. Uh, he says that we're trying on 70, uh, at the bottom, he's, he's comparing literatures with their alternate phenomena of social order at the, the bottom sentence on 70. Um, these are uh, these are disjunctly alternate to this discipline specific descriptive and pedagogic orders of adequate procedures that compose as stock and trade and pride of profession the policies, methods, findings, results, and corpus status of the literatures of the worldwide social science movement. So, we're we're not we're not describing um, we're, the we're not trying to explain social order. Is what what you learn. Uh, we're not trying to derive theories. We're trying to just describe what people are doing. That is, uh, we want to avoid explanatory systems. And uh, again, this notion actually comes out of, of Heidegger more than anybody else. Um, uh, that is, we're only trying to describe how s th things are accomplished uh, and leaving the theorizing for the very last stage, if at all. Um, and it all lies in the way people exhibit, display, and order for the purpose of teaching each other. If you look on, on this uh, same page, uh, starting with the, the second sentence of, 
of the section. The ethnomethodological studies that the chapters discuss do not correspond to order phenomena. They do not represent phenomena of social order. They are not marks, signs, indicators, or symbols of social order. They are not interpretations of indicators, marks, signs, or symbols. They exhibit social order. They are exhibits of social order. Exhibits that people do for the sake of the other people in the room, not for the sake of, of researchers. They are phenomena of social order in endogenous, figurationally identifying coherent details. Now, the figurationally uh, refers to the fact that it looks and feels like the real thing, and it's more than concepts. Uh, and if, if you can remember, those of you who were in the uh, phenomenology uh, se se seminar, the, the, le the seminar on Heidegger's chapter on attunement, which be became transformed as situated action in social studies, um, but his notion of Befindlichkeit, which is translated as a, a, a attunement, the Italian was, uh, I believe, Trovarsi, to find oneself, uh, and it's associated with mood. Um, we need, the figurational here has to do with this attunement, with this mood, as much as the concepts. I mean, yes, people are thinking, so we have to do the concepts, but at the same time, uh, they also have a certain uh, state of mind uh, that we need to also tune into, and that's something more than concepts. So that's what the word figurationally is doing here. Its work of it, these exhibits are work are exhibits of the local order, and it's the part of the work that people are doing. If it's not pre-structured, if this is if it's spontaneous, if it's autochthonous in a true sense, if it's tendentious and not planned out in every detail, then how do people get organized? How do people stumble uh, in in workable ways into this local order that they produce? Then, uh, in the second section of, of this subsection, uh, in the second line on two, uh, Garfinkel talks about hybrid studies. And hybrid studies, I think you guys could write the book on by this time, huh? I mean, you're, you're working with, with people who are doing things. Uh, um, I, I saw some of your first tapes on the forklift people. I mean, you, you don't know how to run a forklift, right? You have to rely on what they're doing. Um, and it's their expertise that, that is guiding you to the f important phenomena about what they're doing. But, as I said with the coffee tasters, they might not even be aware that they're doing it. And they'll look, hopefully, uh, they'll look in, in, with some marvel at how you describe and capture uh, the just what of what they're doing. Um, but you couldn't do it without them. But they couldn't reflect on it uh, to the extent that they, that they could without your participation and your putting words to those practices. So these are hybrid studies. Um, that is, we're looking at the members' lived work of locally doing, not just doing, but exhibiting and instructing and exhibiting by instructing. Um, and, and that they're working together. It's a, there's, there's two kinds of intelligibilities. There's congregationally intelligible and individually intelligible. That is, uh, most social phenomenology operates by just looking at what's individually intelligible. But the Durkheimian phenomenon that we're, and I'm trying to sell Durkheim to these hardcore phenomenologists who would never read, ever read anything by an American sociologist. 
First, they won't read anything by sociologists, and secondly, they won't read anything by, uh, by Americans. Certainly not both, okay? <laughs> and, and, and I include Zahavi, who I have the utmost respect for. I'm, I'm using Durkheim to get Zahabi to take these sociological ideas more seriously than he is, right? I mean, he's a fairly ecumenical guy, so I can do that. But, but, but Durkheim is what's missing in, in much phenomenological research, if you can call it research, because it's more or less recycling the same insights in, in better ways, but, uh, but um, these, these phenomena really, the, the world teaches itself, I mean, it teaches us what, it, what, what these are. Uh, and and the, the mess of, of this intelligibility, it's not as clean as the, the intelligibility that, I mean, how do you explain phenomenology without using fairly simple examples. And when the world itself, given the reflexivity and the indeterminacy of every affair, um, it's harder to do the congregationally intelligible. But that's what makes it so rewarding. It's not just a social group is one plus one plus one plus one. Um, I still haven't come up with a great diagram. I ask you to help me out here uh, for what Durkheim is doing, but there's a quantum leap from the one plus one plus one plus one in the social group. It takes on a life of its own. And that's what Durkheim's point is. That's the immortality of the society. That's the social fact that is immortal of, of the group that produced it. It's, uh, it's, it's something, it's like a movie reel, right? I mean, you know, sure, each frame is a, uh, is a single photo, but they run together so fast it looks like a live stream, uh, and it's uh, it's 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 a different phenomenon. And this is sociology's basic uh, domain: is to look at these at the sociality in the most general term. But that takes us into some very strange phenomenon which Harold calls on page 72, the strange collection. These are all these, if you look on the, uh, the number three there, uh, he talks about the strange collection, and we'll get into summoning phones uh, in a couple of se se seminars. They are strange, without precedent, massively prevalent, massively organized, academically neglected, descriptively finished and in hand, instructably observable, and true. Never mind they're true, you're still not going to get them accepted for publication in many places because they are academically neglected and massively ignored. But, and, but the strangeness is absolutely fabulous. If you study intercultural communication and look at the... The nonsense, uh, a, a good Yiddish word here is mishigas, the, the crazy business of not making sense and yet talking for 15 minutes uh, in a successful way with everybody smiling and, and enthusiastic about how great it is to meet you. Uh, if you look at the craziness of that, of, of not making sense, uh, that's very strange. So, um, but that's where, that's the kind of phenomenon that we're, we're studying. Uh, the problem is, you know, maybe, maybe it's so complicated we're, we're not going to succeed. I mean, that's also a possibility. Um, these things we're looking at, the methods that people are using for cooperating are site-specific. Um, that is, they differ. Uh, Crossing the street at my university on Kincaid is different than crossing the street in Buenos Aires. Very, very different. Uh, it has their, their, their different methods. Uh, uh, crossing the street in Buenos Aires when there's no police officer present 
at the corner is very different than crossing when there is a police officer present. Uh, and you, learn, you have to learn how to do both. Uh, and if you look too guilty, you might get a ticket because nobody's crossing in the right way. It's a fabulous. I, I think I've got to go back to Argentina. Just as, you know, for some reason, I don't know the reason, they don't invest in stop signs. I mean, all over the country, there are very, very few stop signs. Corner after corner, there's no stop signs. It may be clear which way's the main, main thoroughway. And I say, how do you know who has the right? Oh, well, the, uh, the, the, the major road will, will have the right. Uh, I have to stop for them. I said, yeah, but you're stopping in the middle of the street. And they said, well, you know, you, 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 you're negotiating. So you're endless, corner to corner. With stop signs, you know which ones have to stop, and you don't have to, to stop yourself. Uh, but it, 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 the movement of traffic is block to block in Argentina, as this right to get negotiated. And then you have a, a, another principle of size. You know, bigger cars have right of way over smaller cars. So, you know, a bicycle on the main street has to give way to a car on the side street, very clearly. And, and a car has to give way to a bus. And the bus is very confident, is, thinks that they're the king of the road, until they run into, on a side street, a, uh, a, a bank armored vehicle, right, that's just picked up money from the bank that maybe is smaller than the bus, but in a collision would prevail. And <laughs> that's very dangerous. There's, I've noticed several dangerous moments. The whole thing is a fascinating new order because there's no stop signs and the work of organizing the orderliness is done by each party at each corner. But there are principles and principles that I have yet to fully appreciate, which is why I didn't rent a car. Okay. I'll, I'll leave that to the taxi driver. Right? Keep me out of the hospital. So the work sites are very specific. On uh, 74, um, in the very middle of the page, he talks about a, another wonderful line that, that if you're reading this late at night, uh, too late, uh, and you come across the phrase in the middle of the page, endogenous, figurally contextured, phenomenal field properties, you'll grow wool on your brain, <laughs> right? I mean, I can't give this to students, right? Endogenous, figuratively, contextuous, phenomenal field properties. I'll take another class, right? Uh, but phenomenal field properties, it's a term that comes from Gervich, has to do with the looks of the world. That is, what things really look like for, for the people. And it implies that there's, again, that there's more... For the members, the people that we're studying, there's more than just concepts. If there's an idea, there's also a horizon uh, uh, for that idea. Um, and you need to locate the members' work to retrieve what their gaze is. I mean, you, how do you get the looks of the world? How do you get that horizon of meaning you can get the word, you can hear it on the tape, but what is the world within which that word plays? That's what our, our goal is. How do you get that? What, what kind of attunement do we need? We, we need to see their attunement and capture the horizon that accompanies their gaze and their, their words and phrases. So it's a lot more than concepts. Um, the, uh, uh, it's embodied actions, as I'm sure you guys are, are, are discovering. Um, but, uh, but, you know, the, the, the attunement is real, really overlooked, even by ethnomethodologists. Um, let, let, let me tell you what, what I mean. Um, I'm out there, you know, in Argentina. Um, I know my heart is experiencing some problems, because on the big days I'm getting breathless in ways I wasn't before. So I'm going out in very small waves, and I'm, I'm, but I'm getting a lot of rides because the form is great. Um, but 
uh, I'm out there, and the waves are so small. I mean, I'm determined to surf even on a one-foot day. And I'm thinking, this is ridiculous. I'm just sitting out in a pool with a board. You know? <laughs> and, and, and I'm just about thinking of going in when some you know, 14-year-old squirt comes out on a, on a tiny board, and he takes off on one of these one-foot waves like it's a pipeline. I mean, goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. And he comes back and he does it again. But it's, it's not what he was doing. It's not even the concept, oh, these waves are surfable. It's his body energy and temporality with which he's addressing the waves. You just have to pick it up a little faster and paddle a little faster and be, get your nervous system jacked up a little bit and get into these little waves and you can catch them. And once you catch them, they go a long way. And so it's his body comportment that is his, his attunement to the waves of that day that taught me, I mean, thank God he came out. That's why surfers don't always want to surf alone, you know, because other people teach them not just tricks on how to surf or wave selection, but they teach this is, this is the right energy. And after he came out, I caught a dozen or more waves, one after the other. You know, I felt like thanking him. Oh, I had no idea. You just had to had to be a little more intense about it. <laughs> so, so learning that new temporality from the little squirt, <laughs> uh, I was able to have an old codger of '66. I was able to uh, to uh, have a nice day of surfing. So these things are not unimportant, but they are overlooked. So on se on on seventy five, could we uh, have a short break? Yeah, right after this. Okay. Yeah. See, look. No. Oh. <laughs> uh, wow. No, there, no there, there, there's another section after the break. Yes, I know. Who would like to read from that subject uh, about a quarter down on seventy five until the end of the paragraph? Any any good readers out there? Save my voice. From where? Uh, that's uh, about midway in that paragraph, a little bit to the right. The sentence that starts with that subject with a long dash. That subject, mm -hmm. a autochthonous, get your tongue around autochthonous. <laughs> That subject, autochthonous order property of social facts of ordinary society, is distinctive, singular, identifying of, and unique to sociology. It is the distinctive, fundamental, astronom uh, astronomically prevalent, seen but unnoticed elephant in the kitchen, a neglected phenomenon of social order. On the countlessly many issues on which formal analysis exercises a monopoly on adequate and evident description of order phenomena, the phenomenon is impossible to imagine. It escapes from accountability with the for same formal analytic methods that are used to describe it. But once revealed, it is wonderful to see. Yeah, he keeps the wonderful, the marvelous part. Okay, so that's the, uh, the author's uh, introduction. Yeah. We'll take a break and then uh, come back and do chapters one and two. So, uh, let's look at chapter one. Which, uh, on page 91. On 92, uh, the first word is immortal, immortal ordinary society. Um, so what is immortal about ordinary society? Let's look at the, uh, at the footnote. Immortal is borrowed from Durkheim as a metaphor for any witnessable local setting whose parties are doing some human job that can range in scale from a hallway greeting 
to a freeway traffic jam where there is this to emphasize about them. Their production is staffed by parties to a standing crap game. Of course, job, the jobs are not games, let alone a crap game. The, the standing crap game was a, actually an early metaphor in ethnomethodology, really interesting one. Um, uh, the, uh, sometimes they say standing crap game, sometimes they said moving crap game. It's actually uh, a crap game that I guess developed during the days of uh, when, uh, when craps was illegal. You'd move from place to place because you had to keep uh, escaping the cops that were searching for the illegal gambling. Um, and uh, it has to do with the ad hoc character of life, that it's just, it's put together fast and on the spot and it works, and it works very intensely, uh, and then it might have to stop and move and be redone in another place. <clears throat> and in the early days of ethnomethodology, when I first came into it, uh, in, uh, uh, well, really, uh, 70, uh, was my first seminar with Harold, uh, this was a term used by a lot of people, especially Mel Palner, uh, that that it's a standing crap, crap game, and, and I think I think it deserves being preserved because it captures the tendentious quality of affairs, the 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 transitory nature and the myopic nature of of what people are involved in in what they're trying to make orderly. Um, so uh, I want to emphasize this, 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 these words in a footnote because uh, I think the metaphor deserves being preserved. That is, instead of some universal theory of the structures of society, you know, such as you find in Parsons or you find uh, in Freud or you find in Marx or you find uh, you know, in most uh, traditions of social thought. Uh, instead, we're after something much more local, much more transitory, much more particular than universal. Okay, and he gives us an example. Think of freeway traffic flow in Los Angeles. Right, he's, he's living in Los Angeles and and as the sociologist is studying what's before his eyes. And there's a lot of freeway traffic flow. For the cohort of drivers there, just this gang of them, driving, making traffic together. And of course, this gang in Los Angeles is not the same gang in Buenos Aires. Are somehow, smoothly and unremarkably, concerting the driving to be at the lived production of the flow's just thisness familiar, ordinary, uninterestingly, observably in and as of observances, doable and done again, and always only entirely in detail for everything that detail could be. In and as of the just thisness, the hexades, of driving's details, just this staff of doing again just what in concert with vulgar competence they can do, Right? There's a certain way you merge on a freeway, and you have to merge in just that way, or all hell will break loose. There'll be accidents, uh, and you'll, be, you'll get honks. For each another next first time, and it, it is this of what they're doing that makes up the details of just that traffic flow, that although it is of their doing, and as of the flow they are witnessably oriented by, they, uh, these are my words now, they treat it as immortal. That is, although they're the ones that are doing it, so you can talk about the production of, of order, still, that phenomenon will take place regardless of the cohort of drivers who are doing it. It's the same, same merging and the same way in the same place. Every section of town has its own local organization, actually. Uh, and 
the first time you come upon a roundabout that's a little crazy, uh, you might get in the way of everybody. And after, after you do it two or three times, you realize, oh, this is how we do it, and it happens more quickly. And its success depends on everybody knowing how it's going. So newcomers gum up the works, and they have to learn those local practices at that roundabout. And, uh, you know, if there's an accident, it's probably somebody who hasn't studied those practices. But it's the cohort independence that he finds interesting here. That's what's immortal, is the, uh, is the, the, the fact that it's the place itself that seems to demand those practices. But it's not just the place itself, it's the way people have concerted themselves to handle the unique problems of that location. And that method somehow seems to be taught to everybody that uses that particular roundabout. And if you don't do it that way, then you get the honks. Skipping down to the next paragraph, immortal in italics, is used to speak of human jobs, as of which local members, being in the midst of organizational things, know of just these organizational things they are in the midst of, that it preceded them and will be there after they leave it. Right? Like language, right? Like language is going to be there pretty much the way we found it when we were born. I mean, maybe there's a few small changes like... In English, everybody's beginning to begin addresses with the word so. Okay? It's actually a very ugly practice. But even the, the news announcers are, are beginning it. That's beginning their account that it's way. So, even... What? That's the indication of age, if you don't like the occasion. Yeah. Well, I, I was Skyping my son, right? My son is like a... a a vice consul at a U.S. Uh, consulate, and and he's talking to me using so every time, and I'm saying, where did you learn that? You never spoke that way in grade school. You never spoke that way in high school. You never spoke that way in college. Who's teaching you? You use so only after you've said something, not to begin with. But now it's it's so the English language is transforming, right? Uh, but not all that much. I mean, the point here is, in fact, the opposite, that, in fact, it's pretty much the same. It has an immortality to it, that somehow it runs itself. And, of course, my getting my son to change when it's something that runs itself is a, is a losing uh, enterprise, except <laughs> on the Skype call with me, I was at the home of my college roommate, who's my best friend and kind of a godfather to Sonam, uh, to, to my son, and uh, and he, a rare instance in which he took my side, <laughs> and said, "No, son, you have to, uh, you have to learn not to use this word so." <laughs> uh, uh, and so I felt, okay, maybe, maybe he'll listen. Um, so and that's okay because because I just said something, right? <laughs> That's a different sound. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, we say it. We're, we're, we're interested in the circumstantial details that, that comprise these immortal practices. People are actually doing things. And if you'll look across the page to 93, uh, in that that last paragraph, uh, the second, starting with the second, third sentence. According to ethnomethodology's programmatic understanding, the objective reality of social facts was Durkheim's descriptive proxy for every topic of logic, meaning, reason, rational action, method, truth, and order in intellectual history. Specified in any actual case as a congregationally produced and naturally accountable, endogenous order production, populational cohorts, like you can see the students heading for the exits, concertedly witnessable and recognized, 
intelligible, but see, they're not meaningless words. Each word is loaded with observations that are grounded. Intelligible empirical phenomenon of a mortal ordinary society. Therein the phenomenon, phenomena of order consist of lived, immediate, unmediated congregational practices of production, display, witness, recognition, intelligibility, and accountability of a mortal ordinary society's ordinary phenomena of order, its ordinary things, the most ordinary things in the world. So it's, uh, it's in fact, uh, th this is really the last period of, of Garfinkel's uh, uh, ethnomethodological inquiries that, that people are not just doing accounts, but they're, they're oriented to displaying so that you can get the witness and the recognition of these ordinary things. So they're teaching each other. This is the instructable nature of those accounts. Uh, on, on 92, back on the previous page, in the middle par second paragraph there, the first line reads, populations are usually treated as straightforward counts of bodies. I mean, that's, that's what we do in sociology. It's numbers this and numbers that. And we do it because the programs require those numbers. What's wrong with doing body counts? The, what's wrong is that they're not dead bodies. They're alive bodies. They're bodies of people who are doing things. And if we don't capture the doing part, it's like taxidermy and not sociology. <laughs> so Garfinkel contrasts surveyable populations with naturally accountable work, things that people are doing. He observes, uh, at the end of that same paragraph, such analytic descriptions are available in all administered societies, contemporary and historical. Understand, administered societies doesn't include every society. There's a few that, that it does not include. But certainly, those societies of Europe and, and the Americas uh, that uh, are administered, that is, who subscribe to what Derrida called the white mythology, that is this obsessive, compulsive disorder of reducing everything to what is clear and distinct and can be controlled, right? And not just Derrida, but Foucault has a lot to say about that. Uh, that in these societies, these, these, uh, these analytic descriptions are all that people see. And they disguise the real world which, which we need to find. The naturally accountable, the, the work of naturally accounting for the order. So formal analysis, the formalization of thoughts, is part of human being. It's, it's uh, to some extent the sapiens part of Homo, homo sapiens. But uh, Garfinkel's is contrasting this FA, the formal accountability, the, the, the formal analytic aspect of, of ordering with the EM, the ethnomethodological naturally accountable work that people are doing. And you get at the bottom of 94 quite a long list that we don't have time to unpack item by item, uh, but there's six, uh, 94 and 95, there are six. Uh, topics of local practices, and there are words like the plenum, the phenomenal field properties and coherence, and hybrid studies, accountability, instructed actions, embodied congregational workplace specific details, the shop floor, um, and these are all important things. Uh, let's just uh, elucidate shop floor a little bit on 111. We get a, a longer discussion of shop floor, what he calls the shop floor problem. If you look at, at toward the bottom on 111, uh, constituents number one on page 111. Have we 
Anybody find 111? The, the, the real tip is always wait for the people you're talking to to get the page before you, you go reading. It's, a, it's something that we don't do with guys, but we, it's a good habit. Okay, number one on halfway down the page. Constituents of the shop floor problem cannot be learned or taught by imagining them. They are not imaginable. They can only be empirically found out. This is one of ethnomethodology's main recommendations. Don't try to imagine things. What is the difference between social phenomenology and ethnomethodology? I would say one thing is social phenomenologists like most phenomenologists try to imagine everything. They're sitting down there in their basement, you know, alone, late at night, <laughs> and they're trying to imagine things, examples that illustrate. That's how the Tibetans do it. They have a, an epistemology that's, that's certainly the match of phenomenological epistemology, but they suffer from their trying to imagine the illustrations Whereas we're going out and finding perspicuous cases that illustrate what we're interested in. So uh, they're only to be found out. Now, once you use the word empirical, you get all these criticisms of anti-positivists. So even our friends are criticizing ethnomethodology, right? Uh, it's, it's a blind empiricism. It's a narrow empiricism. Well, but, but you know, just because you you are dealing with concrete, real, actual details doesn't mean you're, you're buying into the whole empiricist uh, um, uh, presumptions of, of social research. So, uh, the, uh, so the shop floor is how people are doing the, the naturally accountable work that we find people actually doing. He says, it, continuing, it should be entertained from the field notes of anthropologists who have returned from working in culturally strange societies and they are only teachably matters of first-person witness. It's, uh, uh, and if you drop down uh, in number two, the second sentence, still on 111, in formal analytic technology, concerns with, the sh with shop floor problem constituents are worked out and specified with lexical, generically theorized representations of things. That is, uh, that is, the formal analysts are tied to the lexically generated, generically theorized representations. In but what we're doing is not lexical. It's not a worded practice. Continuing, for example, this is done with great frequency and as pride of profession, right? We love every little word that, that we've learned to speak because of all the wonderful insights they bear. They make us happy. Thump, thump, thump. But the problem is they're also distracting and they replace uh, what's really taking what, what the work is that they're doing, that the people we're studying doing. Um, if you look back on 95, um, he speaks of, uh, on line three at the top, the principal subject of his book, that's Durkheim, the elementary forms of the religious life, is its concern with empirically congregated <coughs> origins of the received general categories of the understanding, time, space, classification, force, causality, and totality, worked out in a deeply reasoned order of argument with the use of ethnographic materials on the religious practices of the Australian Aborigines. Durkheim designated sociology as the discipline to carry out this program. While this was not what sociology yet was, it was what Durkheim believed that sociology should be. When ethnomethodology is correctly understood, it is taken in that light. It is an heir to Durkheim's neglected legacy.
Ethnomethodology has been working out Durkheim's aphorism as a specifically incommensurable, inescapably accompanying alternate to the canonical teachings of the worldwide social science movement. So we're interested in the, the practical work or the praxeological work, the, the praxeological validity of instructed action. Instructions, that is, that exhibit the local order. So praxis refers to practices. Garfinkel once got a, a fairly good grant from the Air Force to set up a center for research into the studies of praxis. And he had a big, he got it. Well, what that got him was a room about this size where people came like we're here now and with a sign on the door that says Center for the Study of so Social Study of Praxis. So the, the, the praxis refers to the practices, the, these, these, uh, these, the naturally accountable work that people are doing in, and the way they concert themselves to provide the orderliness. So the validity of following instructions here uh, rests in what we do. Whatever we do, and whatever we do, guided by those instructions, along with whatever cockamamie interpretations of those instructions, because those are worded phenomena as well, that we made, which then informs us what the instructions were about, and not just what they were about, but what they were about all along. So we hear the instructions, we're not sure what it means, maybe each of us has a different idea. Uh, and we have to somehow coordinate those different ideas. The details then can be like artifacts, in that they're tools that we use to enact an orderliness, the way artifacts for the archaeologist who's, who's trying to reconstruct the practices from these tools that he or she finds deep in the earth. And so uh, the, the accounts, the verbal instructions, the displays, the things that people are doing uh, that are oriented toward exhibiting the local orderliness, they are like artifacts. And then people figure out what's what's taking place, and they might get it all wrong. Uh, and th the tenuousness of how they're getting it together is, is indicated on 110 with the word adumbrated. If you look toward the bottom of the page, three lines from the bottom, he speaks of the right-looking adumbrational passing appearances of things. Now, adumbrational is one of those words that if you come to it when you're reading and you don't know just what it means, you won't look it up. It doesn't, it doesn't strike like hexeta you'll look up because you know that's important and you know you haven't a clue, okay? But adumbrational, it, it, you kind of have a clue and, uh, and it also doesn't look so important that you're going to... Uh, I didn't have a clue. <laughs> Did you look it up? No, but I, no. Under, I, underlined, I underlined it. Okay, okay. It's not well, it's not <laughs> but I still don't know what okay, it is. Okay, good, good. Um, well, adumbrational means having it only in outline. You have it in a vague way. You kind of know what it might mean, but you don't know it in any detail. And not only that, but what you do know, the kind, the kind of knowledge you have is so vague that because it's reflexive and is going to be whatever it comes to be anyway, you have to kind of wait to find out what it means. Not referring to the word adumbrational, but referring to, to the, the, uh, the accounts that you're trying to understand. You have them sort of understood, and they're reflexive. Like, like the smoothness of the coffee, right? Oh, I know what smooth is. You know, that's not too tough. You know, some people have a difficult time with, with sweetness because coffee's not sweet. It's bitter. Uh, oh, this is so sweet. And sweet? 
this is coffee. You know. But smooth, oh yeah, I, I know enough about smooth. So I can, I can go with smooth. But still, what you find with the term smooth, with the account smooth, tells you what smooth means. And then you have the problem, each person has a different tongue, but if they're all drinking the same coffee and they do enough talking, they ought to be able to communicate to each other which smooth it is, which particularities are being captured by that smooth. You know, it's on, it's on the, the side of the tongue, you know, not on the front, not on the back. And you, then you go again with this information. And so you, you somehow create some social system that, that works or looks like it works. And again, the looks like it works is part of the adumbrational passing appearances <laughs> of things. These actions, uh, uh, on back on 95, um, I'm not sure where, but I have a, a slide. Uh, these actions involve embodied congregational workplace specific details of making and describing Durkheim's social facts. You want to know what smooth is? Well, smooth is this, and then you taste and you describe, and you have these specific details that eventually, after you've done four more coffees, none of whom are smooth, and then you get that fifth coffee, and you go, oh, this is almost as smooth as the first one. So you get the added detail that, oh, this one is smooth, so what's similar about the first and the fifth, if you can remember? And you get the added clue that the, the fifth one is a little less of whatever that is. And if you can find anything that's a little less in the fifth, but is more in the first, then you're on the road to smooth as a social fact, as a Durkheimian social fact, as something real and a property of the coffee and not a property of your interpretation. So you're producing the objectivity. Um, so these it's very locally specific. And yet, and yet you can give numbers to the smooth. The first one's, you know, an eight, and the second one is a six, and the others are one and two, and these scores can count in the final evaluation of each coffee. So that's objective, right? But still, there's local work. And if there's local work of an intersubjective type, that's subjective enough to be a peculiar kind of objectivity. In fact, my, my thesis now, in, in a stronger uh, commitment than I had when I early came upon it, is that, uh, that you need hardcore subjective rigorous subjective practices to get real objectivity. But that's, that's a different lecture. Okay. On 118, on the top. It is ethnomethodological, in that first paragraph, on 118. It is ethnomethodological about EM studies that they show for immortal ordinary society substantive events and material contents just and only in any actual case that and just how vulgarly competent members concert their activities to produce and display, to demonstrate, to make observably the case, locally, naturally accountable phenomena of logic and order. Everything that people do to to instruct, to, to display, to exhibit, to make observable what it is that they're supposed to be doing is part of this. You know, the next term might be round. And there's a certain way that, that the group of tasters managed to communicate what smooth was well, that sets up a structure of interaction and communication that when they come to the new term round, 
they'll they'll replicate since it's already there and and is becoming a practice they'll replicate that in explaining what round is you know this roundness is such and such and 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 that second cup was was more round than the third cup so that people will tend to routinize those practices all for the purpose of the orderliness formal analysis and generic representational theorizing are models for how things are done rather than how they're actually done so uh, back to 96 in the first paragraph just in any actual case immortal ordinary society is a wonderful beast how is it put together evidently meaning how do they exhibit and make observable these ways of ordering and just in any actual case in any actual case generic representational theorizing models for example get a, a job done with that same technical with the same technical skills and administering them lose the very phenomenon that they profess okay so what Garfinkel would say in seminar after seminar that the formal analytic methods that have that are the pride of professional analysts lose the phenomenon which of course is hiding uh, hi, you have echoes of Heidegger here right but they don't lose it Garfinkel would say in any which way they lose it specifically because and by the formal analytic ways of thinking and reasoning that they're administering so it's they lose it because of the formal be, a, analytics and the more competent and powerful those formal analytics are the more thoroughly they lose the phenomenon what is it to lose the phenomenon you lose the connection you there's no more you can't taste any coffee of any kind you're so caught up in these elaborate structures of interpretation so you need to retain your connectedness. And again, that's Husserlian phenomenology. You need to see, or this is Heidegger's phrase, that which shows itself in the very way it presents itself from itself. You need to, you know, the term is the thing itself. Uh, you need to stay connected to the phenomenon. Whatever methods you use, if, you, if they take you further away from that connectedness, then you're, you're doing it wrong. Those methods are the problem, not the solution. So, uh, formal analytic devices can be used, but only at a late stage. And formal analytic devices can also be used by the members. Members are using formal analytic devices as lay practices. So you have to address them and very often, an anthropologist particularly will take those lay devices and you know dress them up and make a, a more formal uh, affair out of it. In coffee tasting, you have the tasting schedules, but the tasting schedules, although they have the look of you know and of a vital, objective, formal analytic uh, technique, in fact, it's the tricks and games that the tasters are playing with the schedule. It's how they learn to administer the schedule. There's no question that you can taste better with a schedule than without a schedule. Absolutely no question. But the reason is not because of the, of the beautiful objective print qualities to that tasting schedule. The reason is how brilliantly you are using that schedule in your tasting of the coffee. So it's the it's again the embodied skilled local practices of members that's making the objectivity not not something independent of those practices which is what they're almost implying so Garfinkel says further down uh, in the, the middle paragraph uh, yet in italics 
in the middle of the middle paragraph. Yet, for all that, by one and all, it is intractably hard to describe procedurally what the people are doing. Right? I'm sure that's... You, this is certainly going to be your first article from your research, how hard it is to describe what the people you're studying are doing with the objects that they're using. Procedurally described, just in any actual case, it is elusive. Further, it is only discoverable. It is not imaginable. <clears throat> On 99, at the top, each thing in its course. So we want to capture things not frozen as a taxidermist has them, not tamed and, and static, but as the dynamic temporal phenomenon that they are in the course and over the course of the things that people are doing with them. So each thing in its course, more accurately, each thing in and as of its course. Okay, that's, that's twists people a lot. Uh, sometimes he says in and as of its course, and other places he says in and as its course. The point is not to reify something apart from what is local, because the thing is in the course, sure, but it also is the course. That is, he says, uh, your place in line is a place in line, but it is the line. Without these places, there would be no line. So it's in and as the line. It's to capture the, the reality of the dynamic movement of producing the line. It's, it's, and the reflexive quality of, of the perception of the line. On, back on 97, uh, in that second paragraph, the third sentence on page 97, I enacted local practices. Are, and sk skipping one line, in detail, identical with themselves and not representative of something else. Okay, some local practice that people are doing, as mundane as it is, we want, we have a need as scientists to turn into an example of some universal principle of whatever it is we're into. Gender theory, Freudian theory, Marxist theory, environmental theory, network theory, I mean, go on and on and on and on, right? It's not, it, it's not important on its own. It's only important because of the generic theorizing that we can do with it. And Garfinkel is saying, no, it rep it's only identical with itself. Find out what people are doing in detail. Uh, and don't rely on these representational uh, possibilities to ennoble your work. This is a major difference between ethnomethodology and what goes by the name of, of mainstream sociology. One of the reasons I like teaching all over the third world is a lot of them don't know that ethnomethodology is, uh, is the black sheep of the family. Okay? Uh, I mean, in, in India, the first two questions on the national examination to, to earn the right to teach sociology after you get your PhD, to teach sociology in a, in a nationally funded university, the first two questions are about ethnomethodology. Nobody told them it wasn't important, right? Uh, and I had the same reception in China. They were so fascinated by it. And they wanted to learn all about it until they learned from their colleagues in Shanghai, no, the sociologists who had spent enough time in the States to know that ethnomethodology really didn't matter. Right? <laughs> and so they came back to me, we understand it's not at all important. <laughs> what do you say to that? I, I just said, you need to decide for yourself what's important, right? Uh, but in, it, in any case, there's a difference. We think the local details are what people are dealing with. 
always, and other people think that it's it's these universal truths that that are what's really important. So there's a, a hardcore difference of opinion that may never be bridged. That's why Garfinkel said many times, I don't know that he really meant it, but he said, uh, there's no dispute between mainstream sociology and ethnomethodology. We have nothing to do with each other. <laughs> uh, so on, uh, on 101 then, toward the, uh, toward uh, maybe line 12, line 11. These are methods in, here you get the whole list. These are methods in, about, as, and in the midst of the most ordinary things. That is, the methods don't represent something. They're not in a larger affairs. They create the affairs. They are the story. A rule is a rule that in a in a game that 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 consists of what of the rules themselves. So it's both in and as. Uh, and further down uh, the bottom paragraph on 101, a member's method is both a careful with the asterisk, so that we it says we don't know what careful means yet. A member's method is both a careful description and as an incommensurable alternate. And interchangeably, it is situationally tutorial. It, that is, the, the, the people in the local situation are teaching each other, so they're offering tutorials in how you get it done. It is both separably, yet interchangeably, a description that can be read alternately as an instructed action, and B, the in vivo work of following which, as instructions make teachably visible, makes instructably witnessable, exhibits the phenomenon of order, the thing as a pair. That is both the description and the, the, uh, the, the, the order that the exhibition and instruction leads to. Uh, in in Argentina, they don't drink a lot of coffee. They don't drink a lot of tea. They drink a lot of mate, and they drink mate in a cup smaller than this, and it comes with a large thermos where where you're pouring water, hot water, in all the time, and it's a, a kind of a tea, I guess, uh, but it's different than tea. Uh, it tastes great, and they have a, a long. Uh, stainless steel straw, which you have to be careful not to get clogged up, and everybody drinks from the same cup. Mm. I mean, it's an odd practice for an American who's obsessed with sanitation uh, <laughs> and the complete strangers. It's like uh, if you don't drink with, uh, I mean, it's like being in Australia and not going to the pub, you know? It's like, uh, what kind of a person are you? You're, you're a social creep. Right, uh, but but at least you're drinking out of your own glass, you know. In in Argentina, you have to drink out of everybody else's glass, right? And but there's a certain way you do it. And I, you know, first few times I did it wrong, you know. You 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 don't hog it. You have your drink, and then you're done. You pass it on, right? Never mind. You're still thirsty. You have to wait for uh, other people. You know, why everybody didn't get their own cups, I guess. They want the sociality of the occasion. I mean, that's what it's about. It's beautiful. It's actually, the sociality is reminiscent of passing a joint, right? Don't Bogart, you know? I mean, Bogart means, uh, you know, Humphrey Bogart used to uh, mm. smoke and smoke and smoke and smoke. It means hogging, okay? You don't Bogart the mate cup, okay? It's bad manners. But, you know, you don't know that. You know, somebody gives you with great enthusiasm, please drink the mate, you, you're you going to love it, you know, and you drink it and you do love it, and then, then you get scolded for hanging on to it, you know. Uh, I didn't like drinking other people's straw, straw yeah, shared straw. You know, if I knew them, you know, there was one thing. Uh, but, you know, I suppose 
you get a stronger immune system if you have to battle yeah. everybody. So. <laughs> Different philosophy. Um, so, uh, it, so then an, inst an, an instructed action is, is a description. They're not just descriptions, they're also instructed actions. They're descriptions for the purpose of teaching people how to organize the local orderliness. On 107, um, he speaks uh, in the last paragraph of that indented list. Um, he speaks the one that begins with and in italics on 107. Uh, he speaks of the generically theorized structures of practical action that, and he poses that to the naturally emerging structures of practical action that is lay people's daily work. That is, don't mistake the formality of rules for what people are really doing. Right? When, when I'm doing this interesting study with my colleague in Spain, on, on surfing, how surfers organize whose turn it is to get the next wave. And if you see these films, you see all these surfers hanging out. It looks like a mass of 30 disorganized people. And there's only one wave coming. Only one person's going to ride it, at most two if it's an A-frame, but most waves are not A-frames. Uh, how do you organize whose turn it is? Well, you have a lot of rules. And some busy places, they actually put up a sign, you know, uh, and give you some basic rules. Don't cut anybody off. Outside person has the wave. But there's a lot of rules. I mean, it's not just the outside person has the wave. The best person has, has more rights. Uh, the person who's in the best part of the wave uh, has a right, even if he's the second person to get up. Uh, I mean, it's very, very complicated stuff. And you can't reduce it to rules. And they don't have time for rules because, first of all, they have to not get, get a, a, the, the skeg across their neck. I mean, that's the main thing to avoid when you're out there. The, the sharp part of the fin, you don't want cutting you. Uh, people die. Uh, so you're, you're, the, the rules, nobody's worried about, about whose turn it is if there's a huge wave coming and everybody's about to die, right? <laughs> so... Uh, what really goes on, uh, how they really get this job done, doesn't necessarily conform to their own theorized version of how it should be done. So when and how do you get these, the invocation of these rules is, is what we're, we're looking at. And it turns out it has far more to do, uh, I don't want to scoop myself for this summer's uh, talk, but um, it has more to do with the communicability of the rule at the moment it's being applied after the fact than the level of violation, uh, which is very interesting. Anyway, um, so, uh, so it's not only that social scientists develop these formal analytic versions that delude them, but we ourselves, the members themselves, are developing formal analytic versions on a lay basis that delude them. I mean, although most servers are pretty cool, they know that the rules are a bunch of BS, right? <laughs> and if you, and that's one reason you don't invoke rules when you're surfing, because everyone else is going to go, brother, how did this guy, where did he come from? You know, uh, you know, he, he believes this nonsense. Stop talking anyway, you know, because you're out there in the water. Uh, so, uh, it's not, so, so I would say, I would suggest uh, that there's not just the lay practices and the formal analytic practices, but there's the formal analytic practices of the lay people. So, uh, so there's maybe three orders of, of phenomenon and not just two. Um, the, uh, what's taking place is, is described by this phrase on 111, uh, the middle paragraph again the last part of the last sentence of the middle paragraph on page 111. 
Uh, I'll wait because I want you to underline it. Uh, the real and real chiasmatically embodied congregationally workplace specific contingent facticities of making and describing the material coherences of things. So we're not talking about concepts, we're talking about coherences. And the chiasmatically, I know you know, at least those of you who were here last year when we did the chapter on the chiasma of Merleau-Ponty. And if you weren't here, uh, um, I'm told by Yost that it's on uh, YouTube. Uh, the, the, this last chapter of The Visible and the Invisible by Maurice Merleau-Ponty, this chiasmatic uh, phenomenon where, where things uh, somehow interconnect and work uh, without without either one being in charge. They kind of like, like the people find a way to, to create a unity uh, uh, out of their, their individual activities. It looks like a smooth flow. The surfers don't crash into each other. They smoothly interact. Uh, and it's embodied. And it's congregationally done. And it's workplace specific. Every, every break of a surf location might have its own particular order given what the current is doing and uh, or major obstacles like rocks or or coral reefs um, they're all very contingent that affect what the local uh, methods are for making orderly but after you surf there for a while you get the hang of it <clears throat> that's why when you first go out your first rule is don't take a wave right off the bat. Just sit there and observe, right? Yeah, it's other people's know what they're doing. You can learn, and if you if you take off right away and you're not a local, you're in for a hard day, very hard day. Okay, and it's not because of localism. There's good sense to it. Okay, humility's never out of place, right? Right, for surfers it's tough. Okay. Although I was in, uh, I was in, well, I was in Argentina, there was the Argentina Open for tennis, and I saw on TV a long interview with uh, Rafael Nadal, who won the Open, and my Spanish is good enough to follow him, right? It's so great. Uh, and he was so humble, I was just so impressed by him. You know, that there can be an athlete who's not an asshole. <laughs> you know. And there was another one I saw on CNN last night. I don't know the name Oto or something. He's a, he's a uh, Spanish speaking again, but he's black. He plays for soccer for, for a team in England, I think. Uh, and he's like the best soccer player now in England. O T O. E T O. E T O. E T O. E T O. O apostrophe O. E T O. It all, uh, but he's African, isn't he? He's not, he's not Spanish. He's at, well, he's speaking Spanish fluently. Yeah, he, he played in, in Spain. Yeah. His Spanish is impeccable. Anyway, the interview was in Spanish on an English-speaking station. He wasn't speaking English. Yeah. Maybe his Spanish is better than his English. Yeah. But anyway, he was awesome. I mean, he was just a great human being. I mean, and I don't know why I'm talking about this now, but I was... Uh, the, the point is, I guess, uh, 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 humility uh, does have a uh, uh, does still have a role in modern life. Okay, we don't need that part, huh? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, we do. Uh, on page one thirteen, uh, um, could someone uh, in that large paragraph toward the bottom that begins with these properties? Um, on 113, if you want to go to the third sentence, the phenomena that the devices, could somebody read that uh, uh, until the end of the paragraph for me, so I can save my voice? I'll give it a go. I haven't got my glasses on. So. Um, the phenomena 
that the devices are used to elucidate cannot be found or recovered if the devices are interpreted psychologically or if the ethnograph ethnographic descriptions are explicated as psychologized activities and in any case where they are administered as pre-described pre codes the result can be lucid perfectly clear analytic ethnographic description but the description will have missed the subject matter its property and the point of the description with no accompanying sign that they are misunderstood. Yes, this is a warning. And the warning is that the more articulate you are, the less likely you're going to discover that you missed the boat, that you in fact have lost the phenomenon. You, you just get carried away with your prose. Okay, um, now let, let's, let's look uh, again at this, at this list on 94 and 95, okay? Um, and and let's, uh, let's talk at least tangentially uh, about that. Um, the, this is the embodied congregational workplace specific details in number six. The work of making and describing Durkheim's social facts. That is, Durkheim observed what a social fact was, but we're trying to specify it, to give the details of the, of the doing of social facts uh, that Durkheim uh, pointed out for sociology. Um, if you look in the, in the next section, there is order in the plenum. The plenum is, has to do with the coherences. It's what's here that, you know, um, if you don't surf and you're out there in the water, you won't see a wave uh, and you won't know even what a shoulder is. But if you are an experienced surfer, you see all the possibilities right away. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Even as long as I've surfed, and I've surfed since I was 22, and a, a, a graduate student at UC San Diego, that's one of the bonuses, uh, um, still when I show my surfing data to some of the world's top surfers, they see stuff going on I could never observe. So my, my come upon discovered method for doing this research ultimately will be to get you know, 60 minutes of some of the best, most interesting surf clips I can find from, from famous breaks, right, uh, with, with, with real messes uh, that take place, collisions and, and exciting stuff, so that these experts will be entertained enough to not get bored. And then just put my tape recorder on and get them to describe to each other what's going on because they see everything in detail. And, and that's, they see the plenum. The plenum is available to me, but not the way it's available to them. Um, then, <clears throat> let me read that paragraph. According to the worldwide social science movement and the corpus status of its bibliographies, there is no order in the concreteness of things. Right? The old order only comes uh, when, uh, when, when, yeah, when the formal analysts come riding like the cavalry in the Wild West to, to save, the, uh, uh, to save the, the people in covered wagons that, that are being attacked by the Indians. And I want you to know, I've read, spent a lot of time as a hobby in the late evenings reading the diaries and journals of these covered wagon people and the first explorers. And I want you to know that there is no case of Indians encircling a wagon. Zero. It didn't happen outside of Hollywood. First of all, why would you keep running around and around and around if you don't have a rifle? And they do. I mean, it's like volunteering to be killed, right? It just didn't happen. There weren't those. I mean, there were a few attacks, uh, very few, um, but but it wasn't, there were far more attacks of Indians by the covered, people in the covered wagon 
than there were attacks on the covered wagon by the people. But, but you know, uh, one massacre makes makes uh, a thousand movies. It's just like like uh, my friend uh, um, uh, Alan. No, well, well, I, 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 I mean, he was he was a professor when I was very young. So I'm forgetting his name at the moment, but he, he did this great study of the Western movie as a genre. And he pointed out that there was something like in the whole history of the West, four train robbers, okay? <laughs> Yet how many train robberies were there? I mean, if you don't have a train robbery, your, your Western movie is not considered legitimate. It's not authentic enough, right? You have to have the harmonica, you have to have the, the right font on the signs, you have to have the, the Indians encircling the wagons, <laughs> and you have to have uh, uh, a train robbery. And then you have a legitimate Western, right? So anyway, uh, so, so the point here is that um, <laughs> yeah, a dollar to anyone who can, who can determine that. <laughs> um, the, the analytic accounts, the formal versions of affairs, don't correspond to what's really gone on, and we've completely lost sight of the fact that we've lost sight. And the, the better we do it, the more we lose sight. So it's... Uh, it's, it's like the analytic versions of how to use the Xerox machine, right? Uh, you know, uh, who's going to go through that? And they, they do huge years of studies of how to do it, and then they create more complicated analytic versions that people are even less likely to use because that's not how people use things or do things. That analytic order fails in the real world. People don't do what they're supposed to do. It's, yeah, it's the people's fault. It's not the fault of the people that write the analytic versions. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, uh, the, 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 I mean, when I go into a Xerox shop now, I mean, it's gone too far. I mean, I don't even try. I immediately find the nearest young staff person and plead mercy. You know, oh, well, you know, we're not supposed to help you. Yeah, you have to get your card and do it on your own. It's 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 simple. It's just 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 do it. It's it explains itself. Um, on the footnote on ninety five, uh, line four of seven, I learned that ethnomethodologists are not the only ones given to preoccupations with worldly, empirical, local, and specific, unavoidable, real constraints of contingent facticities of shop floor achievements in designed enterprises that must be done in and as the work of local order production cohorts whose practices consist in concerted empirical, he might, he might as well be the only one, <laughs> whose practices consist in concerted empirical coherent details of making a course of contractually promised manufactured aircraft good over the ground of its contingencies, and that these somehow escape from accountability with in-house front office certified methods of reportage and theorizing. Okay, what is he talking about? He's talking, <laughs> he's talking about a situation that took place in uh, the, uh, the Douglas aircraft company in Los Angeles uh, that was making planes for the Air Force. Uh, and the people, the workers on the assembly line, uh, had to make airplanes. They learned how to make airplanes. They taught each other how to make airplanes. And they made airplanes effectively. And then, of course, the management wanted a formal analytic record of the methods they used to make airplanes. And so they wrote up a very competent account of what they did, step one, step two, step three, step four. And then they went back out into the field and verified that this was indeed an adequate representation of what they were doing. So they felt they had these manuals well intact. And the new people to come read those manuals like my students read the rules of the games, right? I had, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe 30 different sets of students buying a game they never played and reading the rules and 
uh, them playing the game, and there wasn't a single group that read all the rules. Nobody reads all the rules because they're not intelligible with, apart from the play. It's only when you play that you can make sense of the rules. You read rules after you play in order to make sense of things. Uh, so the manuals to build the airplanes were the same way. And after the end of the Vietnam War, there was uh, no need for more aircraft, or very few. And so Douglas contracts were diminished, and they had this workforce that they couldn't afford. So they fired half the workforce. And uh, they found that that was fine. They, they had much, a much lower salary output that was commensurate with the level of contracts they were getting with the, state, with the Defense Department. And, uh, and it seemed fine. They, they still were able to make airplanes. This, this is really great. Maybe we can cut it another half and be down to one-fourth of our previous size and, uh, and everything will balance right. But they found that after they cut to a certain point, they could no longer make airplanes. And they said, what's wrong with our manuals? Our manuals don't seem to be able to indicate what to do because the real work was done with the help of manuals, but it was done in addition to the manuals, this, this naturally accountable work. And so they came to the sociology department at UCLA, can you help us find out why it's not working? Right? And that's what Garfinkel is referring to, that they have, that there's the, a formal analytic version in the factory, in the big Douglas Corporation, that, that somehow lost the phenomenon of what workers were really doing to get their work done. So their job then was to find what that, that really was. Um, so, um, many important things that people do are only discoverable, and that's why we have to have a little empirical component to our work. Um, I mean, that's why, uh, that's why you'll discover that people using Xerox machines have more problems that you can't imagine. They're not available to what Garfinkel used to call the transcendental observer, uh, which is what every sociologist wants to be. Can, if How we want don't? to get any food, we have to close space, because most of the food will be gone already. Uh, now, or five minutes from now, or now? Five minutes from now. Five minutes from now, much OK. I so I, I wanted to explain what phenomenal field properties are, but uh, I think I more or less done that. It, phenomenal means the field as it looks for the parties who use them, like, like surfers who see waves where you wouldn't see a wave. Uh, you know, um, uh, on, let's, let's read 109 at the bottom. Um, in fact, I, I, I was also going to talk about hybrid studies, but you, you guys, I don't think, need any instruction on hybrid studies. That's all that you do. So, uh, so I, I could skip that. Uh, we could possibly end with 109, since I think it's a good definition of, uh, of ethnomethodology. Um, in the bottom of 109, number one, constituents of the shop floor problem are workplace practices in congregationally <laughs> embodied and congregationally witnessed coherent phenomenal field properties of making and exhibiting accountable things. That's what we're doing. We are studying congregationally embodied and congregationally witnessable coherent phenomenal field properties of making and exhibiting accountable things. That is, it's more than concepts. It's a vision of the world. It's a way to do things that, for example, uh, I didn't know that these one-foot waves were so full of good rides until this kid came out and with his uh, embodied uh, way of exhibiting to me what I could do with those waves. It wasn't until then, until I witnessed that, when I saw that coherent phenomenal field come into play, that all of a sudden, like a Doppler shift of, an, of a train going by, these these lousy waves that no one could surf were turned into a fabulous day of 
endless good surf. Okay, just whoop. It's just in how the phenomenal field uh, varied. So that's what we're after. The, the, the emphasis here at the end of Harold's career is that it's not just worded descriptions. And so I'm really fond of doing these studies in situations where there are no words, like street crossings, like, uh, like reading occasion maps, like surfing. Um, I mean, this, I think, is really has a lot of potential to open up uh, new eras of discovery for us. Um, okay, uh, so we can stop with that definition. Thank you very much. Sure.